Hi again. Um, today um, I'm going to talk about the recently standardized IEEE 802.15.4K low energy critical infrastructure uh, monitoring direct secret spread spectrum file, which is targeted, yes, <laughs> I did it, <laughs> at low power wide area network sensor uh, applications. Um, we implemented that and we evaluated its performance in a number of field tests um, at 2.4 gigahertz. And that's what I want to talk about. So I will start my talk with uh, an introduction to low power wide area networks, what that is and why we want them. Then I'll introduce the uh, new GNU radio out of three module GRLP1. Before I go into the details uh, of the standard I was just uh, pronouncing. Um, we did some measurements with that, and I want to report these results before I come to my conclusion in the end. So let me start with the low power wide area networks and an admittedly very generic IoT slide. So this is uh, this image is from um, Ericsson, and this is their vision for what they call massive IoT. Um, they have identified a number of, I guess, popular use cases from transport and logistics over agricultural environmental monitoring. Then of course everything that has smart in its name. So smart metering, smart grids, um, smart buildings, and of course smart cities. Down to consumers with their uh, variables. Now even if that's not true for the entirety of those uh, applications, many of them share a common set of requirements. Those are for instance, very low data rates and only very sporadic traffic. Um, think of as low um, as, um, in terms of bandwidth requirements as eight bytes a day of payload. Um, then there's um, usually quite relaxed requirements for latency and reliability. Think, for instance, um, of waste management. Um, if you're intelligent trash can um, doesn't realize it's full right the second it happens, world won't probably end. So this is one case. Um, on the other hand, um, power and size constraints are quite strict for those applications. I mean, you wanna put those sensors anywhere and they are uh, supposed to run off a single battery for many, many years without any hands-on maintenance. That's quite a hard requirement. And now, try to think of a wireless technology you know that serves this kind of requirements. I guess there's none right now. So those can really not be served efficiently by existing wireless technologies. And this is why over the recent years, a new paradigm has arisen, which is called Low Power Wide Area Networks, or short LP1. Those networks are usually a star topology and have huge coverage areas with a cell radius of up to 15 kilometers, uh, even more in rural areas. Um, and of course, they're not used to just connect like 10 or 100 or 1,000 devices. Even the most modest um, estimations say that there are tens of thousands of devices per cell to be connected. Some sources even saying like a million. So now looking at the current technology landscape, as it looks like uh, right now, you'll realize that there's a lot of players. Uh, they have very different approaches, um, but they are basically competing for more or less the same market. Um, it has all been pushed very heavily by propriety vendors. They've been really quick. Um, most popular is probably LoRa. You might also know Sigfox or um, Ingenu. Ingenu was formerly known as um, on-ramp wireless and is, as I read, actually based here in San Diego. Um, those all use the unlicensed shared bands. Um, in the meantime, of course, the standardization bodies uh, haven't been slipping, even though they weren't as quick as the uh, proprietary vendors. Um, so for instance, 3GPP has standardized machine type communications, extended coverage, GSM, or uh, most importantly, narrowband IoT. And those are, of course, using the license bands. Um, and that is a um, standards institution that has been active, and, but this is a non-exhaustive list, uh, to be clear, um, is the IEEE, 
which standardized the, uh, the SSS file uh, I was talking about in the beginning. Um, so, when I was getting into this topic, I realized how dynamic this all still is, how um, it's completely unclear which one of those approaches will in the end uh, prevail. And, and from a research or scientific um, point of view, there's really a lot of open, open questions. Um, for instance, regarding interference, be it self-interference or cross-technology interference, especially in the um, shared bands, then it's unclear how well they actually perform because you sometimes only have white papers from the vendors themselves. Um, and it's also unclear how well the technologies scale and directly linked to the scalability is, of course, also the profitability and um, therefore the question if they can actually prevail. Um, besides from looking at specific standards, there's also virtually no comparison between those technologies available. So it's really hard to decide which one is the technology that suits your application best. So this was about a year ago and at some point I thought, hey, isn't this the prime opportunity or uh, example for creating a uh, Agno Radio application? And so I decided to create an open source testbed or module to facilitate such field tests. And the first project it shows uh, was actually exactly the, the uh, file layer I'm talking about, um, the uh, low energy critical infrastructure monitoring DSSS file. I chose it because, um, yeah, I find it really interesting. Um, it's actually the only LP1 technology that is using the, uh, the 2.4 gigahertz ISM, and the other ones are using the sub gigahertz bands, around 900 megahertz or even 400 megahertz. Um, what it really sets it apart from spread spectrum technology sheets I know um, up to now is that it supports spreading factors to mm, until uh, up to two to the power of 15, which is really 45 dB of spreading gain, which is amazing. Um, and it's also compatible to Ingenuous RPMA uh, technology, and that's also interesting because they, act, they already have fields, um, networks deployed, for instance, around the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, to give credit where credit is due, um, I initially um, initiated this and I supervised this, but actually the coding has been done by a student of mine who did his master thesis and he did really a great job and you can find him on GitHub. Um, but so now let's get into the file layer itself. So it's thought for low complexity devices, so it's rather simple. Um, the frame format consists of a synchronization header, which is a preamble and a start of frame delimiter and the file payload. Um, the file payload is encoded with channel encoding, so RAID 2 convolutional encoder, then there's an interleaver, then it's a differential encoder, and the bits are mapped to one and minus one before there's the spreading with the primary spreading code, which is a gold code with set high uh, spreading factors. And there's also the possibility for an optional OVSF code multiplication, which provides higher robustness um, against intercell interference. The synchronization header is um, encoded in a very similar way, just that there is no convolutional FEC and no interleaver. Those two parts are then concatenated. The chips are BPSK or OQPSK modulated and the whole thing is uh, pushed to the radio. So this is what it looks like in radio. This or in GSC, so very similar. We have the pad source where the uh, payload comes in as a message. Then the, uh, there's the um, forward error correction, which of course uses GRFAC. Um, then we have the interleaver, the differential coding, and the spreading. Then we have the multiplexer, the synchronization header is read just from, from a parameter or a variable and is encoded in a very similar way. And then we have the um, chip encoding, which is in this case OQPSK with a root trace cosine filter. And then everything is yeah, pushed through the radio again. So, but now it becomes more interesting, right? Uh, we're, we need to synchronize this and uh, yeah, recover the information. Um, let me remind you that we are working at sub, sub zero SNRs, like if you choose a high spreading factor, minus 30 dB is totally possible. 
Um, so how do we go about this? Um, first of all, we need to correlate with the spreading sequence, obviously, to get the processing gain and to achieve um, yeah, SNRs greater than zero, and to, so that we can do something with it. Um, problem is, we have ra rather limited bandwidth, high spreading factors, so the spreading sequences become quite long in time. And this leads to a problem in that even really tiny frequency offsets of like 100 hertz can lead to a complete decorrelation when we um, compare the received signal with uh, the known spreading sequence. Um, and therefore, we felt no other way than to do a 2D search, like um, have a modulated correlator bank or filter bank, um, yeah, and just go the brute force way. Actually, if you read up on what uh, the RPMA guys did, they did the same, and they even designed an ASIC for this, because that's just, there seems to be no other way. If you have an idea, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, after that, there's a differential decoding, so we eliminate uh, any static phase offsets and remaining frequency offsets become like a phase shift. Um, and then we can correlate with the actual preamble symbols, which is done in a, some kind of polyphase way, you could say. Um, yeah, and then with this C signal, we can actually do this uh, two-dimensional search. And we're doing the arc max on the magnitude of the signal. So we get an estimate for the frame start time and the, and the course frequency offset, you could say. And based on those two values, we can evaluate um, the phase of this uh, correlation signal or double correlation signal, you could say, and then estimate the final frequency offset and correct that. So I guess at this point, again, a, an image is worth um, a thousand words. What you can see here is this psi or the, the magnitude of this psi signal. Um, we have actually two frames here. Um, and you can see really well, even though it's minus 16 dB um, as an R at the input, we can um, identify the beginning of our friends really, really well. Um, even though we have some false alarms, that is actually not too easy to, to avoid those. Those are basically the, the side lobes of our preamble correlation. And even though we have an adaptive threshold, um, it's hard to get that right for the entire range of SNRs. And basically, we didn't want to, to miss any packets, so we decided that we'd rather discard them um, lay, um, farther down the uh, DMOD chain. Okay, this is what it again looks like in GRC. So we have the uh, USRP source. We have an oversampling factor of four, which we need because we, first of all, have a root raise cosine with a roll of factor of one, so we have double the bandwidth, and then we are multiplying the signal with itself during the uh, differential decoding, so we again double our frequency because we um, convolution, have convolution in the frequency domain. And then we have the uh, frame detection, time, and frequency synchronization. This is exactly the algorithm I just described. And at the output of this block, you, we get, um, well, chunks of samples that uh, correspond to the payload. And this is then, then despread and all that. Um, this is also a point where we again ran into a problem that we didn't expect in the first time, uh, at first, yeah. So initially it all worked well for uh, spreading factors until like 1024, but when we cranked it up even more, we started losing packets up to a point where it didn't get any packet through even though reception should get better and better. And what actually was the problem that we were doing this over the air with two different uh, USRPs, we had just clock drift, and again, for the maximum spreading factor, even the shortest payload that is possible um, creates frames that are 4.5 seconds long. This is more than enough time to drift considerably. And um, so we had to implement the DLL so that we wouldn't um, at some point miss the eye opening. And the DLL kicks in every now and then and then just compensates the accumulated clock drift. Okay, then after that is just the inverse transmitter, you could say, sort of differential decoding the interleaving um, and the channel decoding before everything is packed back into a message again and passed to the upper layer. This is then the hierarchical uh, transceiver block, which is inspired by um, the um, style, I would say, of the GRI IEEE 802.15.4 module Bastian Blössel did. So we have message ports, which uh, communicate with the upper layers, and we have streaming um, complex baseband ports, which 
communicates directly uh, with the radio, as well as some um, debug ports. And of course, you can also uh, configure this file layer to your heart's desire. So you can change the gold uh, the, the spreading factor, the gold code seed. You can change the preamble length, the payload length, and all that. Um, yeah, so this did actually really, really well. And so we decided to take it outdoors. And we took a, a USAP and put it on the highest building we had access to, which was the uh, KIT campus physics building. And we took another B210 and went to four different receive locations, which we considered to be somewhat yeah, representative. Um, so for two of them were actually on campus, just a few hundred meters away from uh, the transmitter. But one of, the, one of them was actually almost um, line of sight, you could say, just a tree in between. The other one was a really bad non-line of sight scenario where there was actually the um, university's library in between, so a tall steel and concrete building. Then we had one uh, received location about, uh, over two kilometers away in a commercial area, uh, which was also an online of site. There was a small forest in between um, and some low houses. And the last received location we chose was about four kilometers away on the balcony of an apartment building with direct line of sight um, yeah, to the transmitter. I also noted how many Wi-Fi APs were nearby because, of course, we're in the 2.4 gigahertz net um, band, so what everybody would probably expect is that there's a lot of Wi-Fi interference, and we wanted to see how much that impacted our uh, performance. So a few pictures. This is what it looked like. Um, the picture on the left shows the transmitter on um, the roof of the physics building. We have a omnidirectional antenna, a B210, and uh, again, an ordinary commercial off-the-shelf laptop. I think it was actually the one I have here. Um, and we have the receiver, which looks pretty much the same. We have an ordinary Wi-Fi antenna, omnidirectional user P, laptop, and mounted on a stand so that we do, wouldn't have to stand there like this for minutes. Um, so these were the results. Um, we measured at multiple frequencies, and you can see the other results in the paper we published uh, in the proceedings. But this is the results for uh, 2.45 gigahertz, which you could consider a preferred frequency because it's right between Wi-Fi channels 6 and 11. So you would expect to be uh, yeah, less prone to interference, um, at least in a planned environment. Um, we configured the file to use one megahertz of bandwidth, uh, 16 by payload, which is the shortest that is possible, um, OQ PSK modulation for the chips, and 5 dBm transmit power. Just 5 dBm, this was also the maximum we got out of the B210 without any distortions. And we used, as I said, omnidirectional antenna, so maybe 2 dB of gain. Um, what you can see in, in the graphs there, who? Oh, okay. Um, is the frame success rate, or one minus the frame error rate, um, for the different receive locations. And at each receive location, we tried three different spreading factors. So the first two, as I said, we're on campus, roughly same distance, um, but the one was almost line of sight, while the other one was really bad non-line of sight. Um, and you can see that actually the non-line of sight, which was also marginally further away, uh, performed clearly better than the line of sight one. Um, so obviously, path loss hasn't been an issue at this point. Um, we account this to the fact that when we measured the first one, this was actually just right at the end of a lecture, and there were hundreds of students walking past us, probably with their smartphones in their pockets, having Wi-Fi on. So we had lots of great Wi-Fi uh, interferers walking right, right past us during its measurement, and I guess that's what we see here. Um, a totally different case is uh, the third received location, uh, the commercial area, two kilometers away, almost no Wi-Fi. Uh, and here's what you see what path loss, uh, path loss does to our system. Um, actually, only the highest threading factor um, got any packets across, about 50%. But still, we think this is quite a feasible scenario because there's another 90 dB of uh, processing gain to be had if you uh, crank up the uh, spreading factor. And also, the 
area between no frames are received to all frames are received is about 2 dB. So this should be uh, really feasible at this point. The last one is the suburban scenario. So this one is the, the farthest away, had a line of sight scenario, and there's lots of Wi-Fi, um, as you would expect. And this actually showed kind of similar behavior than the first one. Um, path loss, obviously, again, was not an issue, even though it was four kilometers of distance. Um, but the Wi-Fi um, APs nearby had their impact. So we decided to look into this a little more and do a different experiment at, on the balcony of this apartment building. So we fixated the um, spreading factor to the 256, so the lowest one, and then uh, made a sweep and, uh, across the entire frequency range from 2.4 to 2.48 gigahertz, and just to see how much the uh, Wi-Fi APs would impact our performance. But first, let's have a look at this screenshot of a Wi-Fi analyzer app I had on my smartphone. Um, it shows how many Wi-Fi APs there were nearby, and well, there was a lot of them. Um, you see some clustering on channels 1, 6, and 11, but there's also some other networks which just are somewhere in between. You see 40 megahertz uh, networks. So we were really excited to see how it would uh, work out, and when we did the uh, measurements and evaluated the results, you can see a rather interesting um, result. So at the edges of the band, it's actually no problem. Um, the uh, frame error rates are really, really low, but what you can really see nicely at this point is that there's a lot of degradation right around the center frequencies of Wi-Fi channels 1, 6, and 11. Yeah. Okay, so this showed us that even though there's lots of Wi-Fi, and even in uncontrolled Wi-Fi environments, there seems to be um, a potential for this kind of applications, even though you might, maybe wouldn't think that. So let's come to the summary. Um, I presented the uh, GRLP1 OOT module, uh, which implements the IEEE 802.15.4K DSSS file, but it doesn't only um, implement this file, it also implements a second file which is also standardized in, um, yeah, in the standard document, um, which is based on FSK, which is thought for the sub gigahertz frequencies only and is a very narrow band um, technique. Also, I can say that this DSSS file implementation is the first standards compliant and open source um, implementation, and it's made available on GitHub. So again, go there, check it out, and um, tell me if there's anything wrong with it. Um, because it worked that well, we did some field tests. I reported the results. Um, we saw that it's really, it's possible to cover really, really long range links. Um, especially, of course, in line of sight scenarios, but also in non line of sight scenarios. But there, um, actually, the high spreading factors that are offered by the standard are also needed. And last but not least, path loss. And uh, that is not the only issue for this kind of uh, shared spectrum technology. Cross technology is also very challenging and has to be dealt with. Um, for the future, I'm looking into the characterization of the cross technology interference. I really want to quantify how much impact um, Wi-Fi predominantly has on this kind of technology, and if 2.4 gigahertz is a viable choice for this kind of networks. What would also be very interesting to have a look into, but that is admittedly a little more complex to do experimentally, is uh, the investigation of self-interference or multiple access interference in highly or even fully scaled uh, networks. Yeah, so. This is all I have to say. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you very much, Felix. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, over oh, here, Scott. Do you have any plans to uh, calibrate the loading on your APU? Can, can you repeat the question so that it gets mic'd? Uh, okay. 
did you spend any time to calibrate the loading on your A to Ds in a noise dominated environment? Your A to D saturation levels are extremely important. Actually, no. <laughs> any other questions? No? Okay, thank you very much. All right, it's gonna take us a couple minutes to get set up for the panel, especially since uh, half of the panelists are running the workshop. Um, it's kind of poor planning on my part. So probably, what time is it now? Oh, so they are gonna be running the workshop for another 10 minutes. So we probably won't get running here for maybe another 15 to 20. Um, so we'll get rolling as soon as we can. Oh, actually in the meantime, uh, Ballant, are you, do you wanna make a quick, you wanna come up and make a quick announcement?